Okay, so let's get cracking. Uh, on Patreon, James asks, spin rate data has revolutionized the analysis of baseball pitching in Major League Baseball, and pitches are often improving after changing their approach using the data. It seems inevitable, inevitable that the um, technology would come to cricket in the next few years. What sort of analysis would you like to do or see with spin rate? Um, so the company, James, I believe that, that made the big breakthrough in baseball is a company called Repsodo or Repsido. I've forgotten the, the exact name, but I actually contacted them after reading about them in baseball and was like, I'm assuming you're making something for cricket. And they were, I don't think they've made it yet. Or as far as I'm aware, no one has it, but you're right. Um, it's, it's huge. I think for, um, for spinners, it will be really helpful to be able to work out what they're doing, especially if you combine that, uh, the way they do in the MLB, it's somewhere like driveline baseball, the way they combine that then with the super slow motion cameras, um, you know, whatever it is, the 4,000 frames per, per minute, per second, whatever it is, cameras, the, the hummingbird cameras. Um, once you combine the two, I think bowlers would learn so much more about what they actually do and what works for them and what's going slightly wrong, that, like micro errors that can have a huge um, ability to change things. For instance, uh, you know, one of the things Ian O'Brien talks about, the heavy ball. So I always think that the heavy ball is misused as a phrase because it's usually given to guys who are big and strong um, when they bowl, whereas actually Ian O'Brien's theory is that heavy ball is backspin. Now, whether he's right or wrong, that doesn't really matter. What we'll be able to check if um, is if, you know, we can get a bowler to put a lot of backspin on the ball, what does it do? And what is the reaction at the other end to the actual ball? And is there a way to get even more backspin on the ball, for instance? So right across seam bowlers and spin bowlers, revolutions and all those sorts of things will just completely change the way we think of it. I talked to Rajasthan about this last year. As far as I'm aware, they have not got those cameras, um, but they might have, and just no one's you know, said anything about them publicly yet. Um, but there's certainly those devices are going to come in. And I, I, I think in baseball, they talk about pitch creation. I don't think we talk about delivery creation enough in cricket and the ability to, I mean, the wobble ball is quite a simple ball, but still not every seam bowler in the world has the ability to bowl it. And certainly a lot of people who can bowl it then struggle to bowl normal balls afterwards. So these sorts of, you know, um, these sorts of advanced uh, machinery would certainly help in cricket. Satchmo says, are batters on average perform, uh, preferring heavier bats than in the past? And if so, how is this changing the game? Yeah, they're a little bit heavier. Um, I mean, heavy bats have kind of uh, always existed. Clive Lloyd, I think Clive Lloyd's bat would probably still be heavier than kind of anything that happened uh, in a modern game. In fact, the old bats were even heavier. Traditionally, especially before overarm bowling became a thing, uh, bats could be three or four, uh, three or four pounds regularly. Um, so you're looking at quite a bit of difference um you know uh, over the years i think in that era 1930s sort of era where batting took over lighter bats certainly became a trend uh, to be able to play more cross bat shots um also to give batters more flexibility and now i suppose it's almost like a combination of what you really want is the ability to move the bat like it's a light bat but for it to still have the weight and size of a heavier bat um but i wouldn't have thought over the last uh, because batting, you know, the way they dry out bats has changed um, and, and the way that we treat the willow has changed. I wouldn't have thought the bats are massively more heavy. But if you look at Chris Gale, for instance, Lance Klusner was another one. There's a few of the sort of more modern power hitters that certainly have a heavier bat. And we don't have as many bats now that weigh, what, two pound five, two pound six, maybe uh, make a few more that probably weigh around two pound seven. Um, but there was a lot that were two pound five, two pound six, probably in that era from, I don't know, maybe let's say 1900 to 1990 ish. Um, and those have probably gone away, but batters are bigger now as well. So, you know, if, if you're, if you're the size of Chris Gale, a three pound bat is not the same, um, as it would be for, um, Don Bradman, Don Bradman would have struggled to bat with a three pound bat. Whereas for Brad, uh, for, for Gale, it's not quite the same because of the way that he's trained his body. Ray says, would you rather bat with a bat twice the legal size or half the legal size? Ray, I would like to bat with a bat that is twice the legal size uh, because I'm pretty sure I would struggle to be out bowled. And I think that even when I edge, even when I play and miss, I don't think I play and miss by enough to get a lot of edges to that. Um, so that is why we have, that was one, one of the first changes we had in cricket, of course, when a man turned up to a game with a bat that was, you know, wider than the size of the stumps. Um, in fact, I played in a game where we allowed someone to do that once and it was terrible because he couldn't swing it properly. <laughs> it's like this 
weird giant paddle. Um, but uh, geez, it was hard to get him out. Um, as long as he could work out how to hit the ball on the ground. Um, so yeah, I go with that. HW341 says, people often talk about how well or not players in the past would have done in modern T20, but which modern white ball specialist do you think could have made the transition to first class cricket success successfully um, if they'd been playing before 1963? Um, I mean, I've talked about Andre Russell before. If you look at everything about Andre Russell, his career early career stats look very similar to what uh Larry Constantine's did um so I think uh you know he's someone who's seen as a t20 only player um who would have been fantastic in in you know in red ball cricket if there was no white ball cricket Andre Russell still would have been a fantastic cricketer would have been a different kind of cricketer he may not have been the legend he is now because you know the game certainly um treats his skills far better than than the red ball game Samuel Badry would have been a really interesting bowler on um, on on wickets, uh, wet wickets. I would have thought with the way that he bowled his leg spin, you know, quite fast, um, fairly accurate, subtle changes um, in either direction. I think he would have been a really interesting one. Um, I suppose Rashid Khan would be would have been unplayable on those wickets as well. I would have thought, maybe slightly shorter length, so he would have had to push it up a little bit more. But I'm sure he would have worked that out. Um, I'm trying to think of who else uh, are, are very good uh, uh, T20 players or, or one day players. Um, uh, I think that to be, I, I, I look at cricket in the same way that I I assume car racing people look at car racing, which is remember there was a you know there was an Australian car racing driver who I think at one stage did Indy cars, um, Australian muscle cars, maybe did the Indy circuit and also did uh, um, driving in 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 the truck racing circuit. If you're a good driver, you can change to all those things. It doesn't say that your special skills might not always, you know, make you the world's best go-kart driver and the, you know, the best driver at Le Mans and also, you know, the best drag car driver. But as a general rule, all those things sort of all play together. And I think cricket's the same. So I think that, I don't know who, you know, someone like Harry Gurney or um, Andrew Ty, all those guys would have found ways back then because, what they are really good at is working out how to find almost a a way to become professionals within the system and then exploiting that. Um, they would be different, but I think that almost everyone who's good at cricket can be good at this format. They might not all be stars. So at, at, at any format, I think that's the case. It's just that some cricketers are more limited, so they have to specialize more. I think I think that makes sense. Uh, what impact do you think expected wickets can have? So this is Crick versus Metric. Uh, we've seen in football, XG has changed analytics uh, and has made differences. Do you think we'll begin to see it beginning to be mentioned in comms as well? Yeah, I think it's a tricky one for former players to really, um, they really don't like the expected wickets thing. Um, so to, to explain it, if you've got an outswinger from a certain angle at a certain pace and it moves this much and it moves late or whatever, Crickviz can say, well, we've had a thousand of those bowled in test match cricket and, you know, the percentage likelihood of you being dismissed off that ball is very high or very low. I think what will be interesting is when Crickviz can match that with the next uh, um, era, which is going to be the spatial tracking of the batter and actually match it with the, the batter's shot as well. So, for instance, uh, KP hitting the ball from off stump um, and on his stumps over and over again through the leg side, never missing it. What percentage, you know, uh, we're now matching the ball that we know would get a wicket this percentage of time with the shot, which would get a wicket this percentage of time. So we know that like someone like Steph Curry or someone like, you know, a footballer with above average skills can, can, you know, be more successful um, than what the overall numbers go. So, uh, I think it'll, uh, expected wickets will only be mentioned more. I think it's a brilliant um, statistic. I mean, a lot of us have been using a similar kind of thing anyway, because you can kind of work out the same thing with control stats. Control stats are very good. They tell you a similar sort of story. So I think on average in test cricket, a wicket happens every 12 um, times a batter is not in control of a ball. So if you have a batter who is, you know, um, has an extraordinary, you know, is is maybe only in control of, of the shot's, 78% of the time, we could say that that's an innings that is very hard to be able, you know, to be able to replicate, whereas there might be another player who's in the other way. So we're already moving towards all those sorts of things, but they're, all of it's really interesting. 
I did just say this, post Roots 10K milestone, there's talk about whether he can overtake Tendulkar's aggregate. What are your thoughts on this? And do you think aggregate records uh, for test cricket and ODIs can really be challenged considering the amount of cricket played nowadays and the fact that many top players tend to skip skiers more than before? Uh, no, I mean, Root can definitely go past Tendulkar's record. Um, I think Benedict from Sky just did an analysis saying he's got a 38% chance of going past it, which is probably fair when you factor in he could get injured. There will be maybe a form drop at one stage. Um he may get rested, as you say, but I think 38% chance is a really good chance uh, of doing that. Whether we'll ever see anyone go past, let's say, Root or Tendulkar's, or Tendulkar's record at the moment, but if Root goes past him, uh, and Murali's record, I probably doubt it based on the things that you've said there, unless Test Cricket becomes a spin-off sport and it becomes a specialized sport. Go back to the, the you know, the racing car analogy where, you know, Formula One is currently running Indy, car, Indy cars, um, uh, drag races, um, and Le Mans all in one go, if you think about it from a cricket perspective, uh, whereas all those things are in, in racing, uh, in car racing are separate. So if that happens, then all those records are probably back in play again. Uh, but as it stands, Root is probably the last person I think, will, you know, who can beat Tendulkar's record, but who knows what the future will bring and what direction cricket will go in. Joel says, given further injuries to last week's test match and the impact it's had on uh, Leach's uh, concussion and CDG's um, uh, was a heel injury, is it now time to have uh, replacements for all injuries? No. Uh, it's definitely not time to have injury replacements. That is the easiest system in the world to game. There is no fast bowler or wicketkeeper goes into a game without some kind of injury that they could claim um, has taken them out of the game. Even the batters, you know, quite often uh, their backs and their hands and everything. So we shouldn't have injury replacements, but if, if this is something that people are still concerned at, we should certainly have um, um, substitutions. Now, I don't think we will in test cricket, certainly not in the short term, but it's getting sillier and sillier. Um, I think in many ways, uh, the way that injuries completely, I mean, it, there is no replacement for Colin de Grandholm. And there is no real play replacement for Jack Leach, um, most probably in that in, in England team either. Parkinson's a different kind of bowler to begin with. Uh, so it's not an easy situation to be able to done, but that, you know, substitutions are, would allow for those sorts of things to happen. But injury substitutions, I'll tell you as an analyst, I would absolutely game the shit out of that system so easily. I'd be standing on people's toes um, at the at breakfast just to get them out of games. Um, but yes, uh, um, you know, it's something I've written about before and I've talked about a little bit before. If you go back and you look at uh, the video on the future of Test Cricket or the evolution of Test Cricket or no, sorry, how you would redesign Test Cricket, I think it's called. Um, but yeah, I do think we're going towards substitutions in cricket. I think it's almost accidental that we don't have them. Um, you know, a foot took football a very long time to have permanent um, substitutions. I think rugby was another sport that was like that. And cricket just has somehow convinced itself it doesn't need them. Whereas I think we now know um, that it's a necessary thing. Uh, you know, injuries in, in games can, uh, especially to bowlers, can just completely change your lineup so much. Uh, Neil says, do you think that there is any merit in folks batting at five for England with Bairstow dropping down to seven? For me, folks deserves a run in the test team, being the best keeper with a first with decent first class average. However, it's he seems ill-suited to seven, especially with England's current uh, long tail. Uh, so, Neil, I don't know how much you've seen him play. I always think that with folks, the more you see him bat, the less you think he is a, a batter. I think there's a very strong reason why Surrey never moved him up the order. They tried Sam Curran ahead of him at times. Um, and certainly they see him as more of a Sam Curran type batter than a genuine top five first class batter. And if you're not a genuine top class, the top five first class batter, it's really, really hard to make any runs in test cricket. Uh, I think he's done okay so far, but I've seen nothing in his batting that suggests to me he should be batting in the top five of a test match. Uh, that is absolutely for sure. I thought he batted good the other night. What I would say is uh, that um, when it, when he was batting well the other day, I thought that a lot of it was um, at that stage, the ball had stopped moving and the, the balls had got uh, tired. Now, they could have still run through him and he still had to bat really well. I thought he batted really well the next morning as well, even if conditions favored him and he had Joe Root at the other end. I, but, but he also, I, I can't remember, what, I'm assuming the average is under 30 or around 30 in test match cricket while batting in an easy position. To throw him up the order, I just think there's a lot of obvious sort of 
technical flaws within his game. I certainly don't see him as a top five batter. I see that you say he bats number five for Surrey. Uh, I would have thought he would have batted lower down. Uh, Bearstow is a player who can bat number three for Yorkshire. Folks is not a player who you would think of as batting number three for Surrey. If you're going to bat one of them in the top five, it has to be Bearstow. I honestly, as as much as I'd love specialist wiki keepers, if I'm coming at this from my specialist wiki keeper hat on, which I don't have a hat for that, um, I would always want folks in the side. But if you're just looking to strengthen their batting lineup, um, then the best way to do that is the bat best or wherever they think they need to bat him um, and have seven specialist batters um, in that way. Uh, Ian says, referring to the great Ukraine cricket podcast on Red Inca this week, I'll go over there for a Corbus Olivier. Uh, it's an incredible story. I, I mean, it could have been like a four-hour podcast. His his life alone is incredible. And we didn't even get to all the details of Ukraine cricket I wanted to get to because, you know, suddenly Corbus comes out with an incredible thing like, oh, you know, like when I ran that academy with Ashwin. Um, incredible, weird life story to begin with, not to mention the Ukraine war and cricket as they all come together. So go listen to that podcast if you haven't listened to it already. Um, uh can you top the story of Gary Kirsten flying economy to lodgings with no hot running water to coach Kenya in terms of unlikely cricket assignments? I think one of the best ones, Ian, from, uh, was on another podcast you may have forgotten, is Mark Cole, who was a New Zealand coach who his career was kind of going nowhere in New Zealand cricket. Um, was very disappointed with himself, Was had told his wife he was going to take his own life. Luckily, did not do that. Um, and on a whim applied to be the Pakistan women's coach and got the job. Um, I think there are a lot. I mean, the James Foster story of a couple of years ago, what did he take seven coaching jobs in a year or something? Um, there's been a lot of very, very interesting stories uh, for people. And in some ways, James Foster's maybe slightly different. But But in some ways, I think a lot of these guys will do... Uh, <laughs> Someone like Gary Kirsten, and there's a few there's a few other people out there. Mark Cole's obviously another one, but I, I know of players like this that at a certain point they just like to do the game. Uh and they like to, you know, throw the ball down. Uh, if, for instance, my my um my sons are doing under nines cricket or under tens cricket at the moment. And one of their coaches is a Sheffield Shield player. Uh and a very, very, you know, a very, very highly rated Sheffield Shield player got injured. Um, and he's now playing as a professional and he's out there throwing balls to, you know, spoiled nine-year-olds um, when he should be, you know, probably playing county cricket as an overseas player based on his talent, if not his record. Um, there's a lot of people like that in cricket. And the ones like Corbus and Mark Coles and Gary Kirsten kind of make cricket their entire life at a certain point because they can't ever just untangle themselves from it. And so there's probably a lot more stories out there of those sorts of people again and again. Um, but anyway, thank you everyone to pay on Patreon for all your questions. Let us, oh, what have I done here? Oh. So if you have any questions for the Spotify live, uh, pop them through. We've got a couple of written ones, but put your hand up in the Spotify live and ask some questions. Uh, what made Curtly Ambrose the bowler he was? Also, why was he so underrated? That's Siddharth. Um, I'm not sure he was underrated. I think what happened was he came on the back of Ghana holding Marshall, even Walsh to a certain extent. And, you know, you can only keep so many great players in your mind at any one time. And I think that, I think Ghana's underrated as well as Ambrose, perhaps because holding Roberts and Marshall were seen as more skillful and those other guys were seen maybe as more tall. Um, what made Ambrose incredible was his ability to be accurate, his height, his pace, uh, and I think his discipline as well. A, a little bit, him and Glenn McGrath were very similar. I think they came at bowling in a slightly different way. I think he, he was a bit more of a predator and Glenn McGrath was a bit more of a... Uh, I think Glenn McGrath would sit back and wait a little bit more, whereas Curtly sort of made things happen slightly more. Um, but very, very similar, even, you know, you know, similar height. Ambrose was probably a lot quicker when he was younger than McGrath. Um, but by the end of their career, it's probably a similar pace as well. But when you have the skills to move the ball both ways, as they both did, which is impeccable risk control, obviously, when you have the height and the accuracy and a good enough amount of speed, um, 
I think all those things come together and then they, they both had incredible brains. And I think McGrath probably gets more credit because if you look at what happened in Australian cricket before McGrath, there really hadn't been a good bowler uh, for over a decade um, outside of Lily. Whereas even in his own side, um, Ambrose had Bishop, who was probably as talented as Ambrose, but obviously injured. And he had Courtney Walsh. Um, also coming on the back of just legend after legend after legend after legend. But yeah, I think that combination of pace, height, accuracy, and the, the, the kind of brain that Curtly Ambrose had is what made him incredible. Um, I don't know if he gets in an all-time West Indies bowling attack and yet has a very good claim to be in the best, what, 10 bowlers, fast bowlers that ever lived. Um, and on average, probably even further up that, that order. Um, for me, uh, I, I thought he was incredible. I thought, I always wonder if him or McGrath was better. Um, they, they were both... They were both absolute forces for nature. And someone like Courtney Walsh was an absolutely brilliant bowler. And I don't think even that close to being in their um, uh, area. And, and Courtney Walsh was extraordinary as well. Sorry. Emlan, you there? Emlan, I think you got mute on. What's your question? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, I've got. Oh. Yeah, I've got you, mate. Yeah. So the recently concluded test between the the opinions that I saw tweet from Abhishek Mukherjee after the match, where he said that Matthew Potts should have won the match, the match rather than Joe Root because he took thirty five percent of the England's wickets, whereas Joe Root scored thirty percent of the England's runs. I kind of disagreed with him because I thought Joe Root's runs were very important. Whereas, well, England are a pretty poor batting side, and John Root has really scored a fourth of their runs over the last two years. And he said that Pollock has always been the main actor in Test cricket over the last 45 years, and batting has always been the supporting act. Uh, I don't think I agree with him there, but yeah, England's bowling has been pretty subpar. What do you make of this? Do you think England will really won without John Root scoring those runs? But I don't think they could have. But they wouldn't have run. They wouldn't have won without either of those performances, right? Like, think of the numbers that you've just said. So this is why man, man of the match is pointless. It doesn't mean anything, right? It's it's uh, I, it, go through my stuff. I never talk about it. I don't care about it. It's a subjective nonsense. Um, they wouldn't have won without either of those performances, uh, which is a genuine thing. It's very rare that you win because of one person's performances. There's usually two or three people involved at the minimum. Um, then you're getting into, is it better to make runs in a low scoring game or, you know, take wickets in a high scoring game? Generally, uh, you know, uh, we tend to favor batters with those awards. I've got no problem with either of them winning that. Um, I, I thought it was an incredible innings. You could have also given it to Daryl Mitchell, who, you know, also played a, incredible innings and was probably the first person to really conquer that pitch even before Joe Root did. I think Joe Root probably took some lessons from what Mitchell did. Um, so, you know, he's not even in that conversation and there's another one, but you know, bowlers are, bowlers are certainly far more important uh, to winning test matches than batters are. Um, you can't win test matches with only good batters. You can win test matches with only good bowlers. Uh, also, there are fewer bowlers. So, uh, you know, a very good performance from a bowler is usually going to have a bigger impact. Um, you know, when you look at the 11 players, than a very good uh, um a game with the bat. Um, but as far as man of the match awards and everything go, it's just, it's not my bag. Yeah, that's all right. Uh, as an aside to this, uh, Joe Root has scored nearly fourth of England's run starting from January 2021. Has the death side ever been this alive when one batter to provide the runs? Uh, well, probably Andy Flower might be up there. <laughs> um, uh, anyone else off the top of my head trying to think? Aravinda de Silva might have had a period that might have done this. Um, well, Bradman. <laughs> Bradman's probably a very good, you know, just because he scored double, uh, you know, two two lot of um, two lots of runs, two lots of great batters runs. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any others. If you're just talking about a year period, it's probably happened far more than you would think. If you're talking about over a prolonged period, it probably um, 
it probably doesn't happen very often ever um, and obviously won't even with Root. Um, but if you have a very good opening batter in a very poor team, and I'm trying to think of someone... Oh, well, George Headley's early runs for the West Indies, I'm assuming, would have uh, would have been a huge percentage as well. Um, uh, although, if you want the best one, Mathali Raj just retired. Um, she made 17% of India's runs uh, in the history of ODI cricket, not just when she played, but throughout the entire history. Um, so I don't think I've ever seen anyone do something like that before. We've seen it a few times with wickets. Um, uh, uh, Fazir did it for Pakistan, Murali, Hadley. Um, don't see it as much for, for batters, partly just because there are more batters in the side and the tail enders bat, right? So it doesn't look as dramatic as it does with bowling. Um, but, but there's no doubt that it's happened a few times before. Thanks for answering my questions, Jared. No worries. Cheers, mate. Chris, are you there? Chris Hartz, you've got a picture of Ben Stokes and you've got Muton, according to the machine. Yeah, sorry, Jared. Uh, no, I right. to you once. <laughs> I'd be rather yeah. than just Patreon. Uh, my question is, what do you think? What do you actually think of the 100? Do you think it's a competition that English cricket needed? I certainly do. I think it's, it's, uh, We've got the domestic talent to, which needed refining, and but obviously it comes with a lot of money and it's cost a lot, and and it's the your long-standing county fans that will not aren't fans of it. <laughs> yeah, um, do I think it's needed? Yes, I think. Um, uh, what's the best way of putting it? Uh, I think probably from the eighties through to. I don't know, let's say 2019, I think in, uh, cricket was on a decline from a national conversation to very much a niche sport in England. And anyone arguing against that because they go to a county game and see, but put, put it this way, Chris, I, when I go to Lords, one of my fun games when I'm on the tube is trying to work out if each and it, uh, which person is going to the cricket and which person is not, and it's not a hard game to do. And um, in a normal environment, that I'd be looking for team shirts and white hats. But the actual skin tone, the um, the outfits that people choose comes from a certain class of people who go to those games over and over again. And you can do a similar thing kind of anywhere um, with cricket at times in the UK. That's a huge problem, right? Like if... Sorry, go. I thought I loved the blast. I'd go regularly to Edge Preston, but... You're getting probably between five thousand and ten thousand max, even maybe yeah. apart from the Worcestershire game. It's a great night, but for the first game I went to Red Preston for the hundred, it was maybe twelve, fifteen thousand, and then I think come the end you got two two sellouts. And even though it might have been cheap, there might have been discounted tickets. Uh, I was shocked to be fair how many actually came into the grounds. We'll see this year whether it's. Yeah. And, 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 it. and and honestly, the grounds don't matter, right? Um, it, it's good for the local boards. It's essentially good for the ECB because it gets a bit more tickets stuff. But modern sports are not built on people going to them. Modern sports are built on streaming, a little bit on TV, right? Still, although that will disappear sh shortly. It really is how many people you can get to watch it. This is a much better TV product um, as far as the ways it's set up. I would argue that fans in the stadium and a full house makes a game a bit more watchable on telly. I don't know if that translates. It out. does. It does. I watch an IPL it... game over maybe another league with a lower attendance base. Yeah, but, but re regardless of that, you, you can always make the ticket sales cheaper. You can come up with other ways to get people into the ground. What matters is, what, you know, I, I don't know what I don't know what they. I would say in cricket that it would be somewhere around 95 to 97% of the money comes in via TV rights and streaming compared to two or 3% for ticket sales worldwide. UK is slightly different. Australia is slightly different, obviously, but realistically when it comes down to it, it's like, there's no competition here anymore. Right. From, from the moment that uh, sport went on to cable TV, cable TV rights and TV rights, even on free to wear have been what have paid for sport. And it wasn't that case before, before it was certainly the grounds. Um, when you are, if you were trying to get it back onto free to air TV, which is essentially what the ECB were trying to do, 
the 100 was a tournament that they had to do that with. There was no way that the uh, BBC was going to be taking five Blast games, right? They, it wouldn't have worked for them. Then you have to bring in the advertisers. One of the reasons that the 100 put the women so front and center wasn't because the ECB loves women's cricket. It's because the advertisers were like, we're well, starting a new tournament. We want to advertise on women as well. We want women to be in our ads. Um, you know, we don't just want this to be a male sport. Again, that is much easier to do when you're starting a new tournament from scratch. So look, at the end of the day, the 100 is just another T20 tournament with a weird kink in it that hopefully one day will be sorted out or we'll end up with 83 different tournaments of slightly different lengths. Um, but that's all it is, right? It's everything else that allowed it to go onto free-to-air TV that made it a better product to be talked about, uh, that brought women involved, that brought more advertisers, that brought diverse fans in. All those sorts of things were a success. As a T20 tournament, just the same as everything else, really, just with different uniforms and different names. Um, but I definitely think it was needed in, in English cricket as, um, uh, you know, especially as... I spend more time with my kids going, you know, to their practice and all those sorts of things. It's the same people. It's people with similar backgrounds to, to, to me and my wife, or, you know, uh, immigrants to the UK who come from cricket nations. Um, it's the middle classes. Um, it needs to be spread, you know, and that is what the idea of the hundred was. The hundred, I think the people who hate the hundred don't understand that the biggest problem that cricket was facing as a sport was that it was narrowing to such a point that, it was almost inbreeding itself to, you know, a, a lack of relevancy and a, um, what's that, you know, um, it, it was almost waiting for fans to die and then the sport would die. You have to continue to keep building your fans. And for 40 years, English cricket had not done that. And the only thing that happened was the T20, which was actually a, a lovely um, little thing that happened. And then England had allowed that to, to go back into the county game again and not grow the game in the way that it should have. There's nothing wrong with county cricket, as I've said, uh, as an entertainment um, uh, uh, vehicle for people who love it. And I've got no problem with county cricket. I go and watch it all the time and would love, you know, if anyone ever wants to give me a job, just count from county cricket and pay me money. I'm more than happy to do that. But when it talks about growing the game, when it talks about getting the game into new conversations, when it talking about getting women and people from non-traditional cricket backgrounds into the game, English cricket had done very little. And I think the hundred did, did a lot of those things, even if it did it in a haphazard sort of accidental way. Yeah. And I think the, the, the benefits for the women's game is just humongous. Uh, I think England needed it comp to ultimately compete with Australia. And hopefully, from an English point of view, that the wide ball talent can continue to grow for that. It will really help develop and refine English talent uh, yeah. who are coming through. No, no doubt. I mean, look, it's a good tournament. It's a better tournament than the Blast. If you can run both of them at the same time, you're in a perfect situation because you can use the Blast as your development league and then use your 100 as your your um, top of the tier um, tournament. That would be perfect, um, you know. Yeah, just the night with the gap calendar and the weather and Oh, I mean, you know, the way that cricket is run doesn't make any sense. And, you know, that what I've just said won't make any more sense than what currently is. Uh well, well that is what currently is happening. But but from a development point of view, um, you have so many players in England playing white ball cricket. As you said, from the women point of view, it's the only way to catch um Australia at the moment. Thanks for your question though, mate. Uh Keshuv, you there? Yeah, hi Jared, can you hear me? Yeah, mate, what's your question? Yeah, so just currently watching uh, West Indies versus Pakistan series and uh, it was supposed to be played last December, part of the ODI Super League. So just made me think that uh, the ODI Super League, uh, which which might not be a part of uh, cricket after the 2023 World Cup. Uh, so when... ICC went from 14 to 10 team World Cup uh, after 2015. You know, all these associate nations were uh, not really in favor of that because that limits their participation. And now they're again going back from 10 to 14, I think, in 2027. So just wanted to ask your opinion, like, which format do you think is a better one? Because in one, you get, like, four teams direct participation and the other one gives... 10 teams World Cup, but then, you know, uh, 
because of the Super League, more teams get a fair chance of getting into the World Cup. Yeah, I don't think there's any reason why we couldn't continue the Super League and have 14 teams, though. Yeah, that's true. But it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to be either or. It's just that you know they've decided on that. Like it's an arbitrary thing to suddenly go. Oh, we, we don't need this because A, B, C. It doesn't make any sense. Um, I think the more games that those teams play, the better. But I wonder if you talk to the teams themselves, is the appeal of the World Cup when it comes to sponsors, when it comes to everything else, so huge. Uh, that it doesn't outweigh it. You, it's probably more one for the teams that are on that fringe to answer rather than me. Um, uh, I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to make a guess on what would work better for them. But if you're looking at improving the uh, quality of associate cricket, then you know the 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 league makes a lot more sense because they're going to be playing a lot more cricket. And you know, uh, you, Holland at the moment. You know, the Dutch at the moment when they're you know they're playing in that game. Um, they have the ability because their county players aren't available to try a bunch of youngsters against a fairly decent West Indies team, develop players in a way that years prior just didn't exist. This just not, you know, and then later on they'll be playing England as well. So certainly the ability to um, develop talent with associates, you need this kind of league. Um, but uh, I don't see why it needs to necessarily be linked directly to the World Cup. I think that's just a, um, uh, an accident maybe or a reaction or them trying to fit too much cricket into too small a space as usual? Do you think uh, like right now Pakistan I think is ranked 10th in that uh, Super League table so do you think ICC might be fearing the fact that one of the top nations might lose out on direct qualification so let's just scrap it? Um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, the Pakistan rights give a fair chunk, but realistically, <laughs> the easy way to do that is just make it 14 teams or 16 teams. Um, we are at a point now where we have more strong teams than we've had ever before. There's absolutely no reason not to have a proper World Cup. Um, I mean, I would argue that that's been the case for a long time, but certainly now it'd be very, very hard to argue against that. So if they're still making those decisions based on that nonsense that they came up with in 2007, they need to just get over themselves. This is, if this is a proper sport, then we need to get beyond, oh, let's make sure that we gerrymander the World Cup so all the famous teams can get in. If the famous teams aren't winning, they can fuck off. Just, uh, just last one follow-up on this. Uh, so uh, Pakistan was supposed to play uh, ODIs in Sri Lanka as well, but they got cancelled and the tour just consists of test matches now because they said those ODIs are not a part of the Super League. So how do they decide that which series will be a part of it and which one might not be? Oh, I don't know about that. Um, uh, yeah, that might be someone for, for someone who's following the Pakistan um uh, seen directly um but yeah i'm not i'm not sure how how the uh exact uh, um series are, are worked out but my guess is that um there's only you only need to play an amount of one day cricket uh and so there are always going to be a, a bit like how england played new zealand in a non world test championship um uh test series so we know that those sorts of things are always going to happen cuz what they're trying to do really in some cases, they're trying to put a league structure on top of a thing that's not a league. And in other situations, they're trying to make a league from something that's not already a league. And they're trying to then whack the two of those two things together. Um, and there's going to be there's going to be heaps of oddities within the system. Thank, thanks for your question, mate. Thank you. Right, no one else. I'll just go to some of the written questions. Johnny says, do you expect to see significant progress in the use of stats in test cricket tactics over the next 10 years or are deep stats less useful in the red ball game than the white ball game? Uh, look, there's absolutely no doubt. I've, I've probably mentioned this heaps of times before, but when Cricket Australia got a company in to help them with analysis, they called test cricket the monster, the analysis company. Um, it's so endless. And I think there are, there are certainly things that you can do. I think that teams are already starting to look for like-for-like like type players. And that was something, uh, weirdly enough, 
I don't know how many years ago I had a conversation with Royal Dravid about Red Bull analytics when, when he was coaching um, India A. Um, and we would, and he was asking me about the future of it and cause he couldn't quite get his head around how it would work. And I, and I told him about a situation where, um, I think it was Mitchell Stark had been dropped. I think that's right. And they brought Chad Sayers into the side as a replacement for him. And I said that I don't, I think that they thought Chad Sayers was the next best bowler, which is fine. Chad Sayers had an outstanding first class record. And I certainly thought he'd serve to go. But my point to Raul Dravid was, is he replacing what Mitchell Stark brings to your side? And is there someone else out there that could replace what Mitchell Stark had brought to your side? Raul Dravid's answer was probably not, right? Because there aren't that many six foot six fast left arm bowlers. And he could be right. But what was it? When was Mitchell Stark taking his wickets? When was he at his most use for this team? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Because Chad Sayers was going to be at his most use over the first thirty overs, and for those first thirty overs, he's going to nip the ball around. Then after that, he's going to be a holding bowler, a hold, holding bowler when needed. None of those things replaced anything that Mitchell Stark does, and so I do believe that there is certainly a lot more analysis that needs to be brought into the game just to understand why this player is good and how this player is specifically helping your team. Uh, and the same when you're trying to work out, you know, the opposition plays and everything else. So I think in some ways, test cricket is more exciting from an analysis point of view because there's so much more data from each individual game, but there's so few, there's a lot less games, which does make it trickier. Um, however, I think that because the conditions changed throughout the game, that in some ways it can be a very hard thing to follow up. So for instance, I would I would assume that plan B against Ben Stokes from New Zealand was probably bowling short to him. And not Ben Stokes, Ben Folks, sorry. Um, was probably bowling short to him. But by the time Ben Folks came out to bat, they probably thought that the pitch was playing so low, they didn't want to tire out their bowlers by going short at him for a long period of time, hoping that he made a mistake. I think that was probably wrong. But I'm assuming that would be one of their major plans for him. I think when he came out in the first innings, they bounced him, even though the ball was still wobbling around a little bit at that point. Test cricket brings up those kinds of irregularities far more than T20 and one-day cricket does. Those are much more enclosed games. So the data is much more accurate in some ways and is much more regular. Um, you know, we definitely have different kinds of white ball pitches around the world. However... I would say the difference between, you know, one end of a white ball pitch and the other end of a white ball pitch is probably far closer than what we have over the period of five days in a test match. So um, it's tough, but it's not impossible to to use more data. And I'd be shocked if there isn't more coming in. Plus, to, you know, go back to James's question from before, you know, things like Rapsodo or Rapsido, whatever it was called, and, uh, you know, and, and the new cameras that are coming into the game and all those sorts of things, they'll all give more information to test players as well. Uh, special tracking for fielding is another one. Alan says, a couple of questions. Uh, do you know anything about uh, where Anil Manawa is now? I do not know anything about um, Anil Manawa now. Um, not even sure the last time I thought about it. What? Sorry. Um, um, and do you think spot fixing took place specifically England and Australia and India for the tests? Uh I'm not quite sure I understand what your question is. Do I think that spot fixing happened in test matches between England, Australia and India, if that's your question? Uh, look, I think that I think the biggest cynic in uh, cricket will say that any time a, a game is televised on TV, there is an element of fixing to it. Um, you go from that to someone who doesn't believe any fixing until, you know, News of the World does an expose on them or someone comes forward like Lou Vincent Um uh, to say everything's falling apart. There's a lot of middle ground between those two things. It's something as a cricket writer that you... It's so hard without any evidence to ever write about. But at the same time, there's absolutely no doubt that it is always part of the potential for anything. I, I mean, I don't know why you've sing, singled out Australia, England and India uh, for spot fixing. I kind of think that any match can be fixed at any time. And 
uh, and one thing that players don't like is when I, I say spot fixing is match fixing. The role players are like, oh, it's not, it's not throwing the match. And they're not defending their actions or anything. But they're trying to say that you can bowl one bad ball and it doesn't mean anything. Like that. Once you fix one ball, I hate the phrase spot fixing because once you fix one ball, you're fixed the match, right? Um, the, the outcome of that game has changed because of that one ball. Um, there has been an element of fixing in that game. But uh, to get back to your point, I mean, I don't know. Uh, there, there is no way to, I mean, you could ask me that about kind of any game in the world at any time. And I would have to give you the same answer. I think that it's one of these things that in private, I, I think, I think it's, I can't remember if Andy Ball might've written this once or someone like Andy Ball wrote that in athletics, there's a lot more talking about, um, if that person is doping compared to the amount of time we talk about, is that person fixing in cricket? Um, I wonder how much of that is just that doping is an ab, you know, athletics is an absolute sport. Look, this guy has done this time and this time is ridiculous. Maybe they are doping. Whereas this person has played this bad shot. This person often plays bad shots. Is this person playing bad shots because they're fixing or just because they play bad shot? Um, there are certain patterns that I don't think you can overlook. Um, I wrote about Sri Santh before, and, uh, I certainly believe that, um, Sri Santh was a, um, uh, was someone who probably was sold under the bus for many people doing many bad things. And then he may not have actually fixed that particular game, but I do believe that he was involved in fixing. And if you have a look at his record, the amount of wides that he bowled, I think is above and beyond what you would expect from a, a slightly wayward swing bowler. Um, so when you start to see patterns like that, you certainly start to think, well, Maybe there's something going on here. Oh, sorry. Alan's just gone. Uh, Al Jazeera had a documentary highlighting England in New Zealand 2016, Australia in 2017. Well, it's interesting, Alan, because you say that they provided damning evidence. The ICC looked at all of that evidence. Uh, individual cricket boards looked at all that evidence. They did, no one saw it as damning evidence. It was well constructed in, in the documentary. I've seen some of it. I think some of it was sent through to Crick Info at the time. I don't think, you know, as cricket journalists, we did not see any of that as damning evidence. It was a very well put together documentary. Um, and there is absolutely no doubt that there are things there, but evidence, no. And I think that's the thing that you see again and again in cricket is that it's, it's easy to raise an eyebrow. It's not very hard to prove, sorry, it's almost impossible to prove any of this sort of stuff unless it all starts to fall down. And, you know, I've gone down the rabbit holes of, of trying to talk to these people. The, the people who are doing this don't want this to come out, right? Like, I'm not, it's, it's a really closed world that is an illegal world. It's not quite the same as, drug, as the drugs in sport angle because drugs in sport is we can blood test. We can, you know, we can do regular testing. We can have a look at a doctor who's now worked with 10 different people and they might've only been caught once, but, um, they, you know, the nine other people who've worked with them who've won gold medals, we can look back at. We don't have those kinds of, uh, spider legs in match fixing in the same way. And I think that until a journalist or a bunch of journalists work out how to trace it back better. We're going to always be in this sort of weird limbo land, um, of waiting for, uh, um, you know, huge breakthroughs from, from investigative journalists. The other thing is that there's no money in following this. Um, uh, you know, there's, I've never been given any money to do an investigation on match fixing, even when I've had what I would say is very good circumstantial evidence. There's, it's not the way that the cricket media has worked. And so if you think about it, Al Jazeera, who you mentioned, News of the World, there's another one as well, isn't there? I think there's three major ones. They all come from outside of cricket when they did this reporting. And I think that's really, really telling that cricket does not have a system in place for this. Um, libel laws make things very tr tricky as well, don't get me wrong. But I do think a lot of it is, you know, if, if you really, if you had a cricket who you thought a cricket writer who you thought was a really good investigator and they were backed for 12 months 
I think they come back with incredible stories. I think there's a lot of former players out there that want to tell their stories as well. And again, it's hard to get them. On top of all that, and I don't know how much this is talked about, but, you know, within cricket, people believe Hansi Cronier was murdered in that plane crash. Like I've heard that a thousand times if I've heard it once. Uh, they, you know, they, they truly believe that coming out uh, about match fixing and saying things that you did uh, and giving details could end your life. I think Lou Vincent might have talked about that before. I think other people have talked about that as well. Um, that is probably, again, another level of hardcore above what is happening with the doping scandals, which makes it even tougher. Um, but look, there is no doubt that there needs to be some kind of a reckoning. Um, I don't know what the answer is, though. I don't know if it is a media thing, if it's an ICC thing. Um, it's one of the other things that is really, really tricky and again makes it, and I think I've written about this before, is because of the international nature of cricket, it's so hard to be able to follow people with their multiple mobile phones and uh, multiple legal jurisdictions. I can't even say the word. That's how tricky it is. Um, so the whole thing is far more difficult and twisted than, um, than, than the drugs game is. And let's be honest, performance enhancing drugs is bloody hard to work out. Um, uh, for me, I always went down the corruption side of things and when you try and go down the corruption side of things of where the bcci's money goes for instance and um why the, you know a bunch of people on a committee suddenly changed their vote um uh, why this le this team couldn't get a big sponsor and now suddenly with a new chairman involved gets a very big sponsor all these sorts of things that start to happen um Cricket is so small that it gets really uncomfortable. And I think that if you're not funded to do that, I could see why most people wouldn't. When we did Death of a Gentleman, like, you know, we were told they were going to ruin our careers. We wouldn't work in the sport again. And Sam hasn't, if we're being fair. I think part of that's his choice, but I also don't think that he was particularly wanted. I think by that point, I'd kind of forced my way onto the industry and couldn't be sh shaken off as easily. Um, and it is tough. This, you know, a lot of cricket journalism is access journalism. Um, and the ICC are not a police force, right? And gl global police forces aren't particularly, you know, great. So it, look, it's a really tricky one. It's a great question. Um, I think there's a part of me that thinks that m there is far more fixing going on than we'll ever know about. But there's also a part of me that knows that we probably won't see most of it ever. Um, and there's, I think there's a way that we watch modern sports where we kind of have to accept that, whether it's sports washing, politics in sport, um, gender in sport now through the whole, you know, uh, turf trans nonsense. Um, uh, and by trans nonsense, I mean, you know, people suddenly pretending they're interested in women's sport um, because they don't like trans people. Um, all those sorts of things. Uh, we watch sport kind of, knowing that all that is happening and we turn off, you know, you can watch Usain Bolt without thinking, did he, um, did he cheat? Uh, even if you might think he might have, I, th I think that we've come to that point, um, where <laughs> so much is going on in sport. And, and I remember when the sky racing or whatever they were called, the, the sky cycling team were doing really well. And my thought at the time was, um, the way they were talking, it was quite clear that they were breaking rules. And I remember then the Houston Astros, a very similar thing when I read the book on the Houston Astros. I did podcast with a guy who wrote the book on them. And again, I was thinking, if they're willing to do all this stuff, they're also cheating. And, and I think right across sport now, whether it's fixing or cheating to win um, or doping or any of those things, I kind of feel like we already know enough and we've decided that we're going to watch it anyway. Um I don't know how that helps. We've gone into a long rant there, Alan, but I, I don't, that's kind of what it is, right? Um, that's what we are watching. We are watching a golf tournament from Saudi Arabia with a guy who used to be, who run by a guy who used to be very close friends with Donald Trump that is completely a tournament that is there so that we think of Saudi Arabia in a, in a, a positive way. 
But if we like golf and there's a bunch of golfers there that we want to watch and there isn't a major tournament on at the same time, we're still going to watch it. You know, and and we might know intellectually all that other stuff. Um, and obviously listeners of this podcast are going to be different than maybe casual sports fans, but whether we know or not, it doesn't seem to stop us watching that often is, is I suppose, the best way of putting it. Um, I think that's everyone, unless someone else has put their hand up. They have not. Beautiful. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for the questions. Um, uh, you know, uh, there's, what have we got? I've got a Mathali Raj video coming up. I've got a Jeffrey Boycott video coming up. I've got a Stuart Broad video coming up. Um, might have something on Kane Williamson as well. I can't remember now. Uh, but there, there's a few other videos coming up. Uh, if you haven't listened to the latest Red Inca podcast with um, uh, Corbus about cricket in Ukraine, definitely think that is worth your time. Uh, incredible person, incredible story. Uh, obviously, you know, huge support out to everyone in Ukraine, whether they're cricketers or not, or all the people who've managed to get out there. Um, but there's plenty of stuff out there at the moment. But again, thank you to Bodyline T-shirts um, and uh, to my sponsors, Manscaped and LinkedIn as well. Um, and I will talk to you again very soon. Mm -hmm.